Hello and welcome to Deep Dive Movie Reviews with me, James Marsh, and my friend Steve Hackman. Today we are talking about Paolo Sorrentino's Oscar entry for Italy, The Hand of God. Hey, but before we begin, uh, first of all, we want to thank all of our new subscribers. Thanks so much. We've got a number of you this week, and it's great to have you along for the journey. If you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button. Do us a favor. Ding that bell. Uh, you know, we're not on a set schedule yet. We'll, we'll get there at some point. And if you ding that bell next to the subscribe button, then you'll be notified when a new video drops. Um, and we have a comment box below that you know what it's there for we love to talk movies give us your perspective and a comment on today's review james what are we looking at okay so the hand of god paolo sorrentino he's best known for winning the oscar for best foreign film for the great beauty back in 2013 uh this is very much an autobiographical coming of age story about a young boy uh growing up in naples in the south of Italy during very specifically the 1980s. And so I think he's drawing a lot from his personal experiences, from his own life. I know he spent like the first sort of 35 odd years of his life growing up there. And it's as much a story, it's a portrait of a family, it's a portrait of a city and a country at a very sort of uh, specific time in Italy's history when it was sort of changing when it was coming out of the shadow of the aftermath of world war ii um, and uh, emerging into you know into the 80s which was a great sort of time of progress and uh uh economic boom for so much of the world so steve what were your thoughts about this one uh, let me say right off james uh this is a beautifully shot movie and it's wonderful to watch uh, Naples. Uh, I've been all over Italy. I think you know a couple of years ago in 2018, 23 years ago, I walked across Italy on the Via Francigena. I love the country. I love the atmosphere. And watching this movie, uh, it, it although I hadn't been to Naples, I just felt that same vibe again. And so um, aesthetically, it's a feast. And for those of you that enjoy that kind of cinem cinem cinematic atmosphere uh, uh the hand of god will give you that will scratch that itch H having said that i've never been a big fan of coming of age films they often don't do it for me i know it's a it's a it's a very marketable story that people like to watch but often i find my own coming of age is often at odds with whatever's portrayed on the screen so i always find myself not relating to it coming of age movies tend to be overly angsty tend to be overly uh like this this inner puberty turmoil with society and growing up i never experienced much of that so there's a measure in this movie this movie can be divided into halves the first half is pre coming of age we're dealing with this italian family in the 1980s that love uh, football, they love teasing and just ridiculing each other mercilessly. There's all kinds of dysfunctions going on. I felt like I was watching the Italian version of Arrested Development. These guys are crazy and they're fun to watch. And then halfway through the movie, tragedy strikes and it becomes this angst driven coming of age movie. And once it moved into that realm, it became much less interesting to me or for me. So but that's my initial thought is I'm watching two movies here. I really enjoyed the first half. Wasn't so happy with the second half. What are your thoughts? I think by and large, I agree with you. I mean, I'm absolutely on board with the fact that Paolo Sorrentino is one of the most visually interesting filmmakers, I think, out of anywhere working today. Yeah, you know, a big, big fan of his work coming into this. Um, the Great Beauty is amazing. Il Divo, which is a film he did about Italian politics, um, which plays like a gangster movie. If you haven't seen that, definitely check that out. Um, and I, I know he's done some TV with the young Pope and the new Pope, but I, I actually haven't seen that. But um, here, you know, right from the off, we have that it's probably a drone shot, what would have been a helicopter shot back in the day over the coastline coming across to Naples. I mean, let's be honest, Naples is not a difficult film to make, uh, a city to make look gorgeous. It looks absolutely stunning, but he has a way of catching it, whether it's in the bright sunshine, whether it's late at night, uh, it just always looks 
gorgeous you know up on the hillsides where they where they have that big meal the big family gathering at the yeah. beginning uh to the windy little cobbled streets uh to the even like the dock dockyards and what have you it, you know it all just sort of smacks of authenticity there's a kind of rural sort of organic um sort of a positivity emanating yeah. from it you know there's something sort of just so rich and steeped in tradition just about everything and i i i know that that's his hometown and so it was like not really up for debate where he set it mm -hmm. but it just feels like because the city is so has so much history mm -hmm. going on and and you see so many sort of layers of the city as it kind of goes down the hillside like that it felt like the perfect setting for this story all about family and the different generations and how the country has sort of changed opportunities and changed personalities for the various members uh, you know even in just the space of one generation, you know, is that mm -hmm. th this is a family that's really had to evolve quickly, you know, yes. and yes, and like you say, there when tragedy strikes halfway through the movie, it's up to young uh, Phil Fabio. It, it now falls to him to grow up really quickly, right. and he has to, you know, face these newfound responsibilities. He has to make those tough decisions about who does he want to be, what does he want to be, what's he going to do with his life uh and he, you know it all comes he wants to be with aunt patricia is what he wants to uh, what oh, he wants I with know. his life but yes. then who wouldn't i mean she's crazy as a bag of hammers but at the Ooh, same yeah, time yeah but uh... <laughs> yeah in that in that oh so european way in those early scenes where she's just stark naked it's yes. not you know and she's not really she's not doing anything she's no. just li <laughs> lying there and you're just like whoa and you're like yes. well, okay well, i understand what's funny the was the whole family was enjoying it too the women were, the men were, the old, the young. It's like we can all enjoy this Aunt Patricia together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's at just that right age. She appeals to all demographics. That's it. She <laughs> ticks all the boxes. And you, there was this moment of resentment in um, in her. Is it is it her? His is Fabio's uncle's face, I think it is, when yes. she's lying there naked and she's like, Fabio, can you pass me a towel? <laughs> and and then the resentment in like, I think it's the uncle when he's like, oh, you get to go and walk up to her. <laughs> you, know, exactly. you get to go closer to her and pass him the towel. And, and then she, when she takes the towel, she just glances at his crotch and goes, you've got so big, Fabio. Yeah, it's, yes. like, it's like, come on, she knows exactly what she's doing. And you know, she's being incredibly inappropriate and she doesn't care. Yes. Um, but, you know, we're all big fans, I think, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, there was real humor uh, in the first half of this movie. Yes, this family is exaggeratedly dysfunctional. And that's why the whole Arrested Development kept coming mm. back to me, where you have these characters who obviously love one another. There is underlying all the dysfunction. There is a cement which binds them, that holds them together. And that really comes through. You can see Sorrentino is really communicating, despite some dysfunction in my upbringing, this was a family that loved each other that would one minute tear down a family member, like whether it was a prank, you know, there's a lot of pranks go on in this film, mm. or just uh, jealousies or just little minor bickerings. But when push comes to shove, they're there for one another in that that Italian emotional, <clears throat> emotional way. So uh, yeah, this this movie had um, had some really strong things going for it, but like I said, once we get in the second half of the film, I I just found it, it it getting boring. It's slowing down. Fabio just kind of mopes from one scene to another scene to another scene, and it's like all the other characters are still kind of interesting, but because it centers on Fabio and he just kind of mopes, um, it's it's kind of. I found myself looking at my watch more than once. Yeah, no, there, there's such a sort of strong initial impression that the film makes. You know, it comes in, it comes in strong, it comes in hard. It, you know, these incredible mm -hmm. visuals, whether it's the city, whether it's that shot of the of the fallen chandelier, you know, in the middle yes. of the room that's still yeah. lit up, and that, that, that opening sequence with Aunt Patricia, where she's like goes goes like curb crawling, yes. essentially <laughs> gets herself in all kinds of trouble, uh, and the aftermath of that. You know, there's 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 a lot more going on yeah. in the first half, and I, I think because it is all so so sort of positive, and it's all about just these bubbly, dysfunctional characters and how they interact and how they live together, and you know, and you're willing to sort of go along for the ride. It reminded me of some of um, uh, 
Fellini's films like Amacord in particular, which is just all about this re the real sort of chaotic um, community of of this uh, of this small town as well. And so yeah, I was I was sort of kind of really going with it. But you're right, as soon as the, the tragedy happens, as soon as his parents die, so there's yes. a gas leak at home, uh, and um, Tony Savio and um, is it Teresa Saponangelo who plays his mother? Uh, well well they, done there. They're well done. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been practicing all morning. Um, they, they they die very peacefully in their sleep, but you know, it, the family is completely unprepared. Yeah, after that, he just becomes this moping emo boy, and you know. We already know that he wants to become a filmmaker, but he doesn't really know how to do that and how to go about it. And it seems like this was the instigating factor to sort of stoke his creative fires, if you like. But at the same time, watching him go through that realisation is a lot of him just kind of yeah, dragging his heels and, uh, you know, slouching and listening to his Walkman over yeah. and over because uh, and, and, you know where it's going it's like okay it's it's him coming to the realization that he needs to leave town and he, he needs to go off and pursue his dream he's not going to get anywhere if he stays and i think i think the film is part of that message because as i was saying there's so much um sort of stagnating history in a way in naples mm -hmm. including so much of his own family that if he stays he's done for no, that, that's communicated very, very well. And to me, the movie you just mentioned, where he is really trying to become a filmmaker, that makes, an, for me, an interesting second half of the film. Unfortunately, mm. that's not what the second half of this film was. We get that at the very end of the film. He has his encounter with his filmmaker mentor, um, and they have this back and forth. And I found their dialogue, which was supposed to inspire him, Honestly, I found it pretentious. I found it, it, it was a bunch of gobbledygook that you would just, you know, it, it, was, it was just kind of this nonsense you would see in a, in a I don't want to say a new age because the language definitely wasn't new age, but it was the kind of gobbledygook that, you know, life is shit and you're just going to have to accept that you're shit and, and shit is what you're going to make until you're not making shit or whatever it was like that. And I just thought, Okay, uh, that that was hugely uninspiring, but it inspired mm. him. And then the movie kind of ends. Whereas I would have liked to have seen the more cinema perdicio, where I see this this young man in the midst of of the loss of his parents and trying to find an identity. He finds it in film and in creating story and finding his his passion as a filmmaker. But we only kind of get tweaks of that until the very end, and then the movie's over. What we get is a second half of him just bouncing from family member to family member, moping. And um, again, it's just um, that that just wasn't as interesting. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I mean, what he say? he says something to him about. You have to have fun in life in order to, if you're going to be a filmmaker, you have to have fun mm -hmm. rather than tragedy or something like that. He was like, the, you know, no, no great cinema has come out of tragedy. It's come out of a sense of fun or something like that. That's true. Which I that's thought, true. which I was like, that's a bit weird because I'm not sure exactly that that's true. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I think anyone who's ever aspired to be an artist or in any shape or form, you know, I think is always indoctrinated with the belief that you have to undergo some great tragedy. You have, mm -hmm. you have to suffer for your art essentially. Mm -hmm. But this guy seems to tell him, or well, he's told by somebody, so he's told the exact opposite, you know, that you, you must retain your sense of fun if you're going to be a filmmaker. But it's, it makes me think of my son, Gabriel, who's in music. And when he was like 17, him saying, you know, cause he fronted a punk band here. And he said, do you know how hard it is to be a, punk rocker and trying to make it in the music business and trying to write punk songs when you have your two parents love each other in a long lasting <laughs> stable relationship and they love me unconditionally he goes how am i supposed to make art in that kind of environment yeah well this is it you know nothing was well, it is the great speech at, is it at the end of the third man when orson wells has this great speech about how uh you know look at looking at europe at the end of so I guess it does tie in, uh, look at Europe at the end of World War II and you've got all of these great art comes out of sort of France and Germany and countries mm -hmm. that have been sort of consistently sort of torn apart in a right. state of flux. But then you look at Switzerland, which has been this kind of safe haven of peace and harmony for hundreds of thousand years and 
all they've ever been able to produce is the cuckoo clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm paraphrasing very, very poorly, but um, no, but the point's well made. Yeah, yeah, I think I think he, you know, it, it really is, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I think he's, it's it's about him, you know, and it's about that dark time that I think really sort of kicked him up the ass, basically, and made Sorrentino be like, right, I've got to go, I've got to go, got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's, I think there's enough sort of individual moments, beautiful moments. I mean, I don't think any of Sorrentino's films are particularly plot driven anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the great beauty. I love that, that you, you say you don't really like coming of age movies. And I think, um, I, I think I agree with you, you know, maybe I did when I was younger and I think it's probably is an age thing, you know, yeah. they don't really connect anymore, mm -hmm. but what I love more and more is a midlife crisis movie. Oh, and yeah. the great yeah. beauty is a great midlife crisis movie okay. about, um, it's Tony Savillo again, who's Sorrentino's regular collaborator. And he's this great, a uh, highly regarded critic and journalist and raconteur and party guy. And he's this most eligible bachelor in all of Rome. And it's his, I think it's his 65th birthday party. And it pr is pretty much just covers a couple of days in his life as he's coming to the realization that, oh, my life is pretty much done now. You know, anything I was ever going to achieve, I should have already done it by now. Right. So he's kind of like, barreling through these sort of couple of days when everybody's kind of being super nice to him and celebrating him but at the same time they're kind of celebrating the fact that, he, that his life the fact that it's kind of done it's mm -hmm. kind of finished and it is kind of a complete thing and he kind of has this real sort of crisis <laughs> and those are the kind of things that are starting to resonate with me a lot more yeah. than um yeah, coming of age movies, you know, movies about losing your virginity or, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, first love or or get, getting into college or being a man or having your first fight or whatever, whatever it is. It's like, I don't care about any of that stuff. I didn't particularly have, you know, a significant awakening moment either. Right. And so, um, so yes, yeah, so I don't, I don't particularly relate to that kind of uh and narrative, no, no, narrative there was, device there was, either. There was the moment in the hospital when he gets the news that his parents pass, and understandably, tragically, was not expected. But when he's told he can't see them, he doesn't even just say, "Listen, despite the situation, uh, I would really like to see them." Like, there's no, I know you're trying to protect me, but um, yes, I'm, I, I'm going to rather insist on on seeing them and paying my respects. It's, he just th throws into a temper tantrum and just starts tearing things up in the in the room. And I just thought, you know, okay, he's a kid. But again, I to so can't relate because my own father died less than a year ago of COVID. He was perfectly healthy. I didn't get to say goodbye to him. It happened fast. I not realized the last time I spoke to him would be the last time I spoke to him. It happened, it happened suddenly and fast. And yes, I shed my tears with my family and we had our, 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 our grief and our grieving and our mourning. But I just, you know, yeah, it wasn't fair. And there's a lot of things that, okay, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a grown man and he's a young kid. But I just found it, Sometimes I, I, I react negatively when I feel like a film is trying to manipulate me into an emotion. They're trying mm -hmm. to get me to get to some place and you haven't earned my, my getting there. And that's what I felt in that scene. You're trying to create this emotion in me, but I'm not feeling it. Uh, yeah, no, I think so. I think so. I mean, it's, um, I think it's, I wonder how much truth there is in that moment and how much how autobiographical that moment is and whether mm. this is almost a cathartic moment for Sorrentino whether he whether he behaved similarly whether yeah. something similar to that happened and he behaved similarly and he's you know revisiting that in order to sort of atone for his lack of response or something I'm, I'm not sure yeah to what degree yeah. but I mean for me as an Englishman the most uh emotionally challenging moment was the moment that refers to the title of the film was the hand of God, which is when we're watching uh, Diego Maradona oh, yeah. pl the, play yeah. for play for uh, Argentina in the '86 World Cup, when he uses his hand to mm -hmm. score against um, against England in the in the quarterfinal in Mexico, uh, you know, which was a huge, huge, huge deal. I mean, what I didn't realize was quite what a hero 
Maradona was to uh, to Naples, the city. I mean, I knew he played for Napoli during that mm-hmm. period of time. And obviously at that time, he was like the best footballer in the world. So, But I, I never had quite made the connection that he would be so sort of talismanic, particularly because he's not Italian. But the impression that Sorrentino gives here is that not only was he sort of almost considered Italian, but he was almost considered Neapolitan. You know, he was yes. their boy kind of thing. Or and God. So I, I, like he's almost God. Oh, you know, yeah. You know, yeah. And was... you, you see his um, his image sort of almost, yeah, in, in iconic, in an, as an icon, you know, you know, they place him next to sort of the Virgin Mary almost in terms yeah. of the, yeah. the importance in the, the iconography of it. Um, but it was fascinating what his is it his uncle, his grandfather says in that moment when he scores that goal, because it was such a big deal, because obviously only a couple of years before that match, England and Argentina had been at war in the Falkland yes. Islands. Yeah, it was a very big geopolitical, um, you know, I think uh, Maradona was always saying, even though it was a bit of a cheat, it's mm-hmm. our, our way of getting back at England. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, it was such a controversial war anyway, because it was one of the last remnants of the British Empire, you know, which had been pretty much dismantled after the end of the Second World War. And in England, I remember the press was like, why are we even fighting this war? You know, it's at the other side of the world. They're, they're just these rocks with sheep on them. We don't even need them. And Thatcher and the Queen at the time were just like, no, it's the principle of the thing. This is our sovereign land. You know, we're going to go halfway around the world and, and waste English lives, you know, to protect the, these sheep, <laughs> these sheep and these rocks. And, and we did, and we won, and they're still ours. And, you know, jolly good, well done. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of years later, we face Argentina in the World Cup, mm-hmm. and they beat us. And it was Maradona who scored both goals in the space of about, I think, off the top of my head, about 20 minutes. And that first goal, which to quote him in the press conference afterwards, he said it was the hand of God and the head of Maradona, mm-hmm. you know, which was, it was total rubbish. You know, it was yeah. clear handball, but it was in your face, England, you know, yeah. here's, here's mud in your eye and all the rest of it. Uh, and then 20 minutes later, he goes and scores arguably the greatest goal of all time. Mm-hmm. His second goal is uh, in, uh, indisputable where he weaves around, I think five or six players and, dribbles it in and it's absolutely amazing. And he scored both of those goals back to back, you know, the greatest, most egregious <laughs> sort of handball of all time, followed by like one of the greatest goals of all time. And See, just the I, way- I, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say I'm American. I was completely oblivious to any of this. It was- Oh, it, really? Oh, okay. It was, I mean, subsequently living overseas and being around footballers, I have subsequently heard the story and I'm, I'm aware of it. But in yeah. 1986, when it happened, no way. Nobody in America okay. that I knew of, we didn't even know there was a World Cup going on. We're, we're, we're into the World Series, baseball, you know. Yeah, well, all, who'd you compete against in the yeah, World Series? Remind other me. Americans and one, one or mm. two Canadians. Mm. <laughs> exactly. I mean, no, it was, it was the biggest deal yeah. ever, yeah. you know, and it was, I mean, but in just the response of his family members, just to get back to the movie, the response of his family members who are mm-hmm. all just on his, and they're just like, oh, it's amazing. It's a, he calls it, he says, it's a revolution. You know, it's a revolution. He's just stuck it to the, to the Brits. You know, he's stuck it to the, to the, to his enemy, just like that in your face, in front of, in front of the whole world, yeah. apart from, yeah. apart from America, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> In front of the whole world, he's gone, not only am I going to beat you, but I'm going to cheat and it's going to count and and I'm going to call it the hand of God. Yeah. And it was just like, wow. And so, yeah, so it was fascinating to see that that this I wasn't expecting this Italian film to raise that and for that to be such a pivotal moment Mm -hmm. in the film. But uh, it's it's probably the most memorable moment for me. Just to say, I mean, it's so it's not it's not my favorite Paolo Sorrentino film. I mean, he's he's unquestionably a great filmmaker, visually stylish, incredible. The cast is the cast is great. You know, Tony Savio is great. Uh, young Filippo Scotti is good. He's got this kind of uh, Timothy Chalamet vibe thing going on. I think um, <laughs> I hadn't we'll probably, thought about that, but you're right. That's spot on. We'll, we'll probably see a lot of a lot of that. And uh, you know, Luisa Ranieri as Aunt Patricia. You know, she's amazing, oh, gorgeous, wonderful Lisa, woman. Yes. So um, I still think Il Devo and the Great Beauty are my favorite of his films. Uh, you know, and this is this is a perfectly it's a good movie. It's a perfectly good movie. But I think that it just doesn't resonate with me 
in the way that um, that some of his other films do, or entertain me and engage me in the way that some of his other films do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what do you give as a final score? Okay, so I'm going to give this um, out of what? <laughs> well, it's got to be it's got to be three three egregious handballs out of five. I think. Oh, okay, I thought it was going to be Aunt Patricia's towels, but okay, let's go with the hand. <laughs> oh, you know what? You know what? Okay, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Yeah, so three. Three, uh, three of Aunt Patricia's towels out of five. Uh, you liked it a little better than me. I'm going to go with two and a half of Patricia's towels, just because a half a towel I get to see a bit more. But uh, <laughs> okay, about this point, we'll wrap it up. Uh, no, I, oh, I, you know, I thought this was, a, I thought this was a, <laughs> oh, good pun, yes. Um, no, I, I thought it was well shot. I know it gets overused to say sometimes. Uh, that a city becomes a character in the movie. But in this, mm -hmm. Naples really becomes a character in the movie. The setting's perfect. Uh, visually, I enjoyed it. The problem is it really tanked for me in the second half. So I'm going to be a little bit cruel and just give it two and a half uh, towels out of five. No problem at all. All right. I can live with that. Okay, James. Hey, until next week. See you later. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. And remember to subscribe. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.